Uh, thanks for taking the time, you know. Appreciate well, asking it. me to uh, thanks for asking me, man. Yeah. Oh, sure. I mean that I, I saw I mean, you, you like, know. Wow. In, Cerkno, in 2005, actually. Uh oh. in Slovenia when you played a solo set, uh, which was Oh called... right, the Dugin Chatform. Yeah. That was like but that's you like were there. I was there. <laughs> oh wow. But that's like oh. a long time ago. That's like yeah. Yeah, wow, 17 years ago. 17 yeah, years ago. Nice. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. But uh you know, I just I'll just jump in and I I wanted to ask you about uh I was quite surprised in a way, but also not, you know, about your album, soul album plays the Duke. And uh All right. You know, I I got used to you know, you playing with Derek Bailey and Tony Oxley and all these amazing. Yeah, things. yeah. <laughs> and then I, this one came out. I was like, man, that's amazing. And uh, <laughs> how did this one happen? I, I know it's like from the Newcastle Jazz Festival, but yeah, you well, know, I, D- I, Duke I, Ellington. I did a. I I am um, I, I well, how it happened is I did a I did a um it came out on Capioto's um download label where I did I did it. They asked me to do some Duke Ellington. Hmm. about what was it five years ago and it sort of seems to become a sort of cult download you know a lot of people really liked it and um so i got asked to do um from wesley wesley stevenson who organizes newcastle Mm -hmm. and he said would you you know yeah and that was last year so it was not last year the year before yeah Yeah, and um yeah. yeah 21 so um but i've been doing a lot of playing duke all my life yeah i love duke Really, but well, I hadn't only started playing it in public when when Capio dropped. It had been about 2018. I've done very. I mean, I've done quite a few things doing Duke. I did a trio with um, Pierre Pierre Zanussi on double mm-hmm. bass yes. and mm-hmm. uh, Stula doing Money Jungle. I don't know that might come out sometime. Oh, okay. In Norway last year. So yeah, I, I love Duke stuff, but you know, you know, it's hard, isn't it? Duke's music's hard to play, and as a piano player, you really don't want to be a <laughs> You've got to be working hard to do that stuff, so I, I have to prepare for that. Yeah. Yeah. How, how did you approach it? You, you know, uh, there's like let's say prelude, uh, prelude to a kiss. There's like hundred solo piano versions out there, probably. You you know, uh, <laughs> it's a scary heritage. Like how, how did it you is approach? definitely. Well, I sort of just I just try to think of a way. You know, um, I I just work concentrate on the tune, concentrate on knowing the piece, and then what mm. can I add to it? What can I? What can I? put into that piece that makes it a bit different from what everybody else is doing with it mm. so i might just decide sometimes i might say for instance i do rocking in rhythm i just play the whole thing inside the piano so it's just like more the rhythm you know so but you i think most people know it's rocking in rhythm but it doesn't you know i'm not playing anything on the keyboard it's all inside the piano and other things i might take an idea the phrase and then yeah. just try and use an extended technique to 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 embellish it so yeah i mean and, and also the inspiration is duke himself if you think about duke he's been playing some of these pieces forever yeah and yet in concert i mean you know even if you hear the same piece it always sounds different so i thought that's the best model is duke's model is to um just he, he never plays it the same way so you know, that's a good point now you don't have to play it the same way and don't have to try and yeah. play it like duke because yeah. Duke's played it in so many different ways. I mean, how many times have you played Pedro to a kid? Or any of those tunes. And yet, you know, I remember there was, you know, so many different versions of Caravan. And they're all yeah, so yeah, amazingly yeah. different. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, it's a great inspiration. And it was um, a bit of a scary one because it was sort of um, my first sort of solo gig since I had the stroke. So it was a bit weird, you know? <laughs> mm. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, yeah, it went well. It went well, and it was well appreciated, and the, and it was well recorded. So. Yeah, it's beautiful. I mean, yeah. you know, the sound yeah, is beautiful. Yeah. What you play, I I love it. I, I, like I say, I was quite like, man, you sound killing <laughs> on that one. You know, like solo piano, gee, you know, like yeah, yeah. And I love, um, you know, and also I love Monk a lot. Um, oh. I'll probably, you know, that um, yeah, Duke and Monk. 
in, in terms of repertoire, then you like you said, you know, you've got to get it done. You've got to you've got to know those tunes. I mean, yeah. ironically, I mean, the test piece I used to to realize when I, that I'd recovered and that I could start playing the piano again was my test piece was evidence. If I could wow. play evidence, I'm not, if I could play evidence, and I could play the piano again. <laughs> That's a hard. So that was a great relief bar. when I could play it. Yeah, because you know, I mean, that tune is, you know. A lot of people, if you know, it's a hard tune to really play. You know, you could so you know that your fingers, that your your control is there. I mean, it's the perfect test piece because then, you know, with the piano, you've got to know if your control is there. So I knew if I could play that piece without falling apart, then yeah. I could play the piano again. So yeah, it's great. Yeah, oh, beautiful. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's beautiful. I mean, was was Duke also one of the reasons how you delved into you know how you came into jazz or like what were the piano yeah, players? Well, I mean, like... the, the first one, the first person who really knocked me out, because um, I think about ten, I might say Louis Armstrong, and I must admit, if he was doing Hello Dolly, I just didn't get it. I thought Hello Dolly, what is this? This big black guy singing Hello Dolly, what's all that about? But when I was sixteen, I saw Oscar Peterson on the TV. And that just changed my life. I mean, really? it's no, you know, without a doubt, he was, you know, because I mean, he's got a fantastic technique, and they had a he had a program that was um, at the time, you know, you could get jazz on the TV and the, you know, mainstream TV, which is, I mean, it's imp impossible now in England. Yeah, but sure. That's, yeah. At that time, when I was about sixteen, and seeing this black guy playing really playing the piano that was the thing he can really play the piano yeah he was and he had he was playing the music i'd never i never even heard of because you know i was classically trained and i just just assumed oh well you know i'm classically trained i'll just go and get get the music out get get the sheet music and play it and that was when things my life changed because obviously when i try to play those pieces that Oscar Peter was playing didn't sound nothing like him you know, yeah. <laughs> whole different concept of rhythm, different rhythm, concept yeah. of Phrasing. harmony. Yeah. You know what I mean? So it changed my life because then I got obsessed with. I've got to find out how how are you doing this. So I listened to so listen to anything with Oscar Peterson or anything sort of jazzy. So yeah, he really changed. He changed everything because it just made me realise that I'd been taught up to that time that once you've got your classical training, mm. you can play anything. It's all on the paper, and here is this music where nothing was on the paper. Even when you had the sheet music, it wasn't really the music. Yeah. It was just like an approximation. And that really changed my um, perception of music, really, to be honest. Yeah. And then for um, when I heard Cecil Taylor, which was really funny, because I was listening to a lot of jazz critics were saying, he can't play the piano and all this. And, and you know, and I thought, so I was a bit cautious about, oh, should I, you know, so there was a record called um, Jazz Piano. Mm. And I had one track of Cecil Taylor. So I thought, well, I can't go wrong because everybody else I know, you know, it's got Up and, Up and Jamel, Bill Evans. It's got all these people who can play the piano. So one track's not going to kill me. Of course, I played that track and I just was gobsmacked. I could not believe what I was hearing. And I yeah. thought, if this guy can't play the piano, who can? You know, <laughs> you know? incredible technique. And um, just made you realize, you know, sometimes people, but, you know, new music and you know i mean cecil's a fantastic i mean he oh, would have man. been a great concert pianist if he wanted to be you know yeah. and um yeah those things change your life don't they you know you so and I, and of course here in duke and you know you know again that's one of the weird things that some people saying duke's not much of a piano player i'm thinking oh, oh man come on have you heard, have you heard, do they know them about the piano yeah i mean I mean, I mean, you know, this whole thing about the orchestra of his instrument. Well, I mean, the guy could play the piano. <laughs> you know, yeah. he can yeah. really play the piano. He knows what he's doing on the piano. I, I just think sometimes it's um, people say things without realizing. You know, it's only you know musicians will realize. Well, that's just nonsense. When I heard you, yeah. the, he's doing it just incredible. You know, yeah. as a piano player. I mean, yeah, sure. If you compare him to, let's say, Bud Powell, which was a different school or someone like that, of it's course, a different yeah. style. But it's mm -hmm. nothing to do with, you know, it's being able to oh, play, yeah. of course, you know. Yeah, and I mean, and, and like I said, you think of the, um, the range of music he could play. Yeah, and you know, it's like Monk, isn't it? You know, people said about what Monk could play. I mean, anybody's played Monk tunes. I mean, if, if Coltrane's struggling to play them. <laughs> Maybe that's a clue that maybe this guy this guy can really play his instrument. You know, Coltrane's having a hard time playing it. Yeah. Maybe, maybe Monk can really play the piano. <laughs> Bizarre, you right? Know, it's, you know, it's, 
So you, I think it's like you said, it's a thing about they, there's a, like a saying about who tastes not knows not. You know, musicians know. I think you know if you're a piano player, I think you're oh, fine. Yeah. Obviously, everybody say if you're a piano player. You've got to go to Monk. If you don't go through Monk, you know, then you're, you're it's, um, yeah, yeah it's... you know, no piano player I I know of who will ever say they don't know, you know, they don't think Monk can play. <laughs> oh, oh, sure, man. It's, but especially <laughs> Cecil, like you said, you know, for Cecil, that was taught many times. Still nowadays, mm. you know, when you speak to more straight ahead jazz musicians like Cecil, mm. Taylor, they're like, oh, what? what? That's terrible. You know, I'm like, man, did you listen to that stuff? The composition, the tunes, the I concepts, know. you know, like. It's it's bizarre that that still exists this stigma of. Uh, I know, I know. You know. I, I I think it's. I don't know. I think maybe it's just sometimes, you know, as we, you know, as we know, jazz is hard. It's a hard piece to master. Yeah. So if you if you've just concentrated maybe ten years on playing one particular style of jazz, you just don't want someone to tell you, well, actually, this is the new thing. It probably does. Yeah, you know what I mean. It must have been a nightmare for people who just got you know just got got to grips with Dixieland. And then you've got Bebop, and then you've got Cecil. And then, <laughs> so maybe it's just like the head just can't deal with it. Look, I've spent 20 years to try to play Bebop, man. Don't tell me this. I've got to try and learn this now. Mm. So I think, you know you know what I mean? I think those barriers put, you know, people do can block themselves with oh, the yeah. music. Well, definitely, yeah. Yeah, you know. So, and, yeah. And, yeah. You know and, and, you know, we all, you know, we all get favorite things, but, I think a lot of, you know, like I said, for a lot of critics, it must be really, I mean, you know, you think how fast the music developed. Oh, yeah. You know, just yeah. they just got a grip to the bebop, and then suddenly, well, actually, now we're doing this now. You know? <laughs> and then yeah. you've got Braxton and all these Chicago people doing another thing, and you've got the new, you know, William Parker. Yeah. He's largely got what all it was doing with prime time. It's just, you know, you've just got to, just got to be open to it all, isn't it? It's hard for some people to be open to everything. You know? Oh, man. But even, you, you know, with the British scene, like, you know, you, you have all of a sudden, like, they're really early, like Kenny Wheeler and John Stevens. Oh, and, I know. You know, Evan yeah. Parker, all these guys starting making this incredible, let's call it free jazz or whatever, improv. Yeah, yeah. You know? And well, it's just like... I was very fortunate because my last gig of the year was doing Evan Parker's tra uh, Trance like Atlantic trance map and it was like um yeah he's made history again so this was a a group one part of the group was in england and the other part was in new york and we had this new system so we it's like we were playing together but it was not it wasn't there was no delay so it wasn't Seriously. like a zoom you know like the yeah. zoom nightmares where yeah this was some new these guys tech guys so we yeah we've made history because we sort of broke the laws of physics i suppose because so they basically improvised basic. in real time. Yeah, in real time. Yeah. Whoa. It's on YouTube on Roulette. If you, I think it's called Evan Parker Transatlantic. But yeah, it was an amazing. I mean, I'm very. You know, I mean, it was a great group. I mean, you know, Craig Taborn, Ikoy and Morier. That's the Atlantic thing. Ned Rosenberg. Whoa. Uh, Sylvia Cavozier. Um, and the English side was like a uh, Peter Evans. <laughs> Evan, obviously Evan. Uh, Robert Jarvis, Hannah Charlton on yeah. cello, um, Matt Wright on processing, and Alex Ward on clarinet. So, I mean, it's in a fantastic group. I'm trying to think if I missed any. Um, oh, yeah, and Matt Maneri. Matt really? Maneri was on the other. Was, yeah. So, I mean, and, you know, there was, yeah, it was amazing. But for me, you know, because sometimes, you know, you sort of think, you know, we were talking about. How many things could go wrong when you do something like you know because it's never been done before you know because you know you know what it's like with the delays and zoom oh, man, it's, terrible. Like, yeah, sure. <laughs> it's a waste of time so we were thinking about all the things that could possibly go wrong you know you've got six people in england six people in new york you've got to get the time right and then you've got to hope all the gear doesn't fall to pieces and it was amazing because you actually were playing in real time in a different time zone and it, it sounded like we're all, and we were, we're all playing together in real time in two different time zones. So, yeah, wow. I think the laws of this have been destroyed again. <laughs> that's, that's the future of jazz, how to save up the money for a studio, you know? Honestly, it, it really makes you realize that, you know, um, I'm, I can't remember what the, but it was, um, I think they tried it before, but this system really worked. Wow. There was no, I think it was Ethernet. So it wasn't like a, there was no delay. And you know how it is. So you've got lots of electronics. Yeah, Sam Pluto as well on electronics. Oh, so wow, Sam Pluto, 
Ikri and Mori, uh, Matt Maneri, Ned Rothenberg. I mean, seriously, Craig Taborn, you know, <laughs> can say, you know. Wow. And yeah, yeah, all, it, it really worked. And the, the music was really, is really happening. So I think, uh, yeah, watch out for that. That'd be, I don't, ju- not sure how long that will turn oh, out. But, yeah, uh, yeah, I'll check it out. But you can ones, see it on, um, if you go to Roulette's website, they should have it on there. I hope they okay. streamed it. They might still have it on there. But it's, yeah, it was a great fun. to be involved though, because and then we had a sort of virtual hang afterwards, which was hilarious. Because, <laughs> you know, because it's like nine o'clock over here, 10 o'clock over here, you know, in England. And I think it's like four o'clock in the afternoon. But it's fast, man. It's it's totally, it's nothing like Zoom. There's no delay. Wow. Yeah. That's incredible. Okay. That's, I know. That's the future. Wow. Honestly, because I'm sure you're like yourself, you know, you know, we, we've all, I remember I was fortunate I didn't really get into the Zoom thing, but. The Zoom things could just be a nightmare, isn't oh, it? Because... For, I mean, for playing music, no way. I mean, for this, this yeah, is okay, no way. but music, yeah, no way. Yeah, this is great, yeah. but not for playing no, music, no. man. No. By the time you've got there, it's um, by the time you've played your phrase, it's just got to them. So I don't know how, I don't know what this tech then, what they, you know, what how they solved it, but it was amazing. Yeah, you're literally playing in real time. Wow. But so, you know, so you didn't, and they had, we had screens, um, you know, so we could see what they were doing, and yeah, it was amazing. And we had an audience in England, and they had one in the roulette. That's crazy. And people were saying, "Yeah, you never, oh, yeah." And the, like I said, the music was fantastic. Oh, sure, because, yeah, um, I believe, yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, wow. so the future okay. is there, man. Yeah, it's going to be crazy, and you know, we all had headphones, so it was like improvised music to, to the next level because we were like guys had headphones, like you know how with the top. Roots now, they've all the drummers got the head, but yeah, so yeah. it's like, well, I'm thinking this is improvised music. It's like <laughs> you're like <laughs> playing same... with Beyonce or something. <laughs> I'll tell you, <laughs> <laughs> it's really crazy, but yeah, it's oh. great music. Yeah, I mean, so Evan put this together, amazing project. You know, and you think about it, you know, the guy's yeah. going to be, you know, to be 80 this year and he's still pushing it. Yeah, amazing. He's, he's amazing. Yeah, he's just like. You know his level. Of... Yeah, yeah. It's crazy. And he's also again, you know, very broad. Again, people have got a very broad sense of music. You know, because obviously he loves him. He's, I mean, honestly, the guy. You know, I mean, he knows Coltrane's music inside oh, out, and yeah. he's probably got, you know, a lot of things that have been, you know, re- been issued. I mean, Evan had them years ago. You know, on these collectors things, and he's got all these special. Yeah. you just can't you know he knows gold train and yet it's funny again because a lot of people when he started doing his own thing there was a phrase with improvised music in the, and and they used to say it sounds like a fire in a pet shop <laughs> and because you know ever doing all them squeaks and that yeah know, they just like couldn't get their head around it you know so, no so i mean funny but... old funny old world isn't it <laughs> oh man yeah i mean it's just like but super that, that's that's good news news if this equipment you know yeah accessible I mean, for I, everyone I, you know that's... honestly it, it'll, it actually it actually means like you said if you wanted to do a gig with somebody in new york do it do a session you can do it yeah once that thing's set up you've got the people who've got that technology you can do it you can play together I mean, that's it's crazy. really, I mean, that's why I was amazed at because I just kept thinking there's so many things that could go wrong here, you know. Like, <laughs> but the actual playing, you were really interacting. We were really improvising. That's crazy. You know, yeah. And you, as you know, with this improvisation, if you can't hear or there's a delay, it's over. So, wow. yeah. Fantastic. I mean, it Super. Really could be, Super. So it could, it could. I mean, I don't know if it kept on. I mean, you know, but it could revolutionize the way people record. So suppose you wanted to make a record with somebody who lives in the States and you can't get to the States. You could just set it up. Yeah. Be amazing. You know, it will be amazing. You save <laughs> you up on money, everything, place. you know. Yeah. 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 Well, that's, that's exciting times. Yeah. Fantastic. But, uh, but Pat, I wanted to just to go a little bit back. And, you know, I think mm. the, the first albums I, I have with you are the early 90s Derek Bailey stuff. But uh-huh. what, what was, you, you, you know, what was, how did you integrate into the you know improvised scene in the eighties? What was happening in the eighties with you music wise? I mean, um, well, I think it's one of the, the, the good fortunes for me is being born in Oxford, mm-hmm. and um, and why I say that is that um, you didn't have the sort of peer pressure to follow any you know you just you know we had our own little school 
I played mm. with my brothers. My brother's a really good guitarist, you know, and oh, really? okay. and my other brother used to play drums. And uh, and in the eighties, we had a thing called the Oxford Improvisers Club. Because I, I remember reading a series of your life, um, you know, the Val Roman book. It really inspired us. And I was playing in a group called Ghost with a great saxophone player called Pete McPhail and a, a, a great drummer who doesn't play anymore called Matt Lewis. And we naively we were playing this group that called Ghost because we were performing for by Albert Eiler. And we naively said, "Oh, it'd be great to start a co-op." So we did this Oxford Improvisers Club. It was just the three of us. We did a gig. And ironically, um, this um, Afro-American guy called Jumat Takata, who turned out to be some giant giant genius in uh, anthropology, especially his expertise is Egypt. But we wow. didn't know that at the time. He was a big jazz fan. And he'd, he was staying at Pete McFell's place at the time. And you know, we said, "Oh yeah, we'd love to do that. We want to do. We want to do a gig at the Hollywell." And he he put up the money. So the first gig was financed by this Afro American guy, and we called it the Oxford Improvisers, uh, presented by the Oxford Improvisers. But it was just the three of us. But it turned out there were a whole bunch of people in Oxford wanted to do the same thing. So we ended up doing this collective, and so we were developing things. And around eighty eight, I think, we had, we got some money together and we invited Derek. And you know, Derek Bailey down, and obviously we know, oh, and so that's okay. how that link started. Okay. And I was lucky to be in Oxford, honestly, because um, I saw everybody. Guess who was living in Oxford at the time I was there? Tony Oxley. Isn't that and right? That's how you connected with Tony. Okay. Well, I didn't know him at the time. I was just annoyed, you know. But what was funny, I didn't know anything about this music. And the first gig I went to, there's a great drummer called Nigel Morris who now lives in the states. He used to be in a band called Isotope, mm -hmm. and um, he was like a jazz rock drummer, but he heard Tony Oxley, and it just, like I said, just that's it. It just changed his life and started playing more open. And I remember going along to the jazz club, and it was him and Alan Wakeman, great saxophone player. And they said, "Today we're not going to, we're not going to play tunes. We're just going to improvise." And I just thought, "Wow, this is how you know." I never heard anything like it. And then the week after, it was like Tony Oxley with this giant cow bell, and that was it. You know, I just thought. <laughs> I didn't know who this guy was. I didn't realize he was one of the all-time greats because I just thought, if this is a local guy, so I went home, practiced. I was practicing hard, but you can imagine, I thought, if these guys are local, I mean, I'll never be able to play in London if I can't, you know. I, I didn't realize these were the, you know, you're talking about the thunder and the creme of music, you know. And I remember oh, I thought everybody, Paul Rutherford, because Oxford, Tony Oxley being there, everybody would come to Oxford. So I saw everybody on my doorstep, Howard Riley, saw Evan, I saw everybody there. Peter Broxman, Oh. Everybody in Oxford. So I was very lucky to see all that music on my doorstep and Paul Dunmore, you know, who you... you oh, sure. I friend. love Paul, yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I grew up with Paul Dunmore. I used to hear him every other week in Oxford. Wow. Could be playing with... So it was crazy, yeah. So I got used to that as normal. So when I went to London, I was a bit disappointed because I, I thought, what is that here? Yeah. <laughs> I heard some of the people playing. It was supposed to be these big names. I thought, well, not as good as the guys in Oxford, not knowing that these were international world class artists, you know? So, yeah, I was very lucky. So, in a way, those connections happen. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's funny uh, for me around 89, you know, so I, was, I was starting to get a little bit of a reputation playing in London as well. And, um, some, there was a rumor that Derek Bailey was interested in me asking me to do something with him. And, you know, you sort of think, oh, it's just a rumor. He does, you know. Anyway, what, what was funny, I, I decided in 89 to take the plunge and to become a perfect, you know, full time musician. So, you know, you're trying to make some money, you're trying to get. And anyway, so he asked me in 1990 to do Company Week. Yeah. And I actually had another gig and I turned him down at first. I said, oh, no. I knew, you know, because I was just trying to be a professional musician and money. And then, you know what? My heart just said, are you crazy? This is what you've been working for. So I had to, and it was a, with a really great friend of mine, Mike Cooper, great guitar player. And so I had to bring, Mike, I said, look, I've got to do this company thing. You know, and it was, um, well, yeah, it, it was, a you know, Eugene Chadbourne, that's when I met Eugene, all these guys. <laughs> and um, Max Gustafsson. Mm. And yeah, and then I got to play with Derek, you know, got to start playing with Derek, and then 91 did Company 91 with Zorn and Buckethead and that. And yeah, that's incredible. Well. That, that's incredible. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. that's like that, such a bizarre mix. Was, oh, man, that was, I mean, Derek was, I mean, you know, it was so funny because so many people freaked out by Buckethead because there's this young guy with this bucket on his head and a mask. You know, it's an improvised concert. <laughs> You've got this guy with a bucket on his head playing loud guitar. 
it was hilarious. It was you know, I was hanging out with, with Derek and he would say to me, Oh, come and have a look at these guys because you know the audience were just in horror. They could but then, <laughs> it was so funny. People were like, you know, used to nice quiet, sedate, improvised music, and he got this guy doing death metal, you know? <laughs> and so on, of course, Derek loved it, you know, he loved being, you know, winding up people like that. But I, I mean, I mean, in that bracket, I mean, he's a great guitar player, man. And sure. he, he can improvise, you know. We almost ruined his career because he said he was back. <laughs> I think so. It, we almost ruined his career because at the time he was supposed to get signed to some label, and we said, "Ah, oh, you don't want to do that." <laughs> <laughs> but he was a lovely guy, you know what I mean? I can't believe he's doing Guns and Roses, man. I, I don't know if what play. I mean, it's hilarious, but I mean, he's a great guitar player. Oh, incredible! Know? Yeah. He's an incredible guitarist, and you know, there's, you know, so you know that that thing. And after that, um, I think around '91, then Tony Oxley was was playing with Derek, and I think Tony Oxley had, was asked by the radio, German radio, to put a band together. So he asked Derek, and unfortunately, Derek asked me, asked me and Matt to do it with them, you know, because we were doing all electronics, and yeah. and that, that was controversial because using drum machines and that people were like, what do you think you're doing? Using drum machines with Derek. He said, Derek Bailey, you can't use a drum machine. Derek had no problem with this. The only other people had problems, but Derek yeah, had no true. problem with us doing samples and all sorts of stuff with him. You know, he was, you know, they were very generous, those guys. And fortunately, Tony Oxley then just kept using I've I've been, I'd been playing, I've been playing with Tony uh, up until about um maybe the, you know, up in and you know, two thousand, mm. I was his piano player. Yeah. So <laughs> And when, unless he's playing with Cecil Taylor, you know, so I didn't see some, him sometimes because he'd be doing Cecil. But otherwise, I'd do all his groups, but I was very, very glad to do, you know, really great to play with Tony. Yeah. You know, so it was a bit weird, these people I'd seen in Oxford and suddenly playing with them. It's just mad, you know? Yeah. But yeah, so in the 80s, you know, developing things with electronics and the piano and, uh, yeah, and that's how I got to see playing. And then in the nineties, things sort of take off a bit more. And you know what it's like. I mean, it's like company sort of open those sort of gigs open doors, and then you know, it's sort of people start to take it a bit more seriously. <laughs> it's not much money, but you know what I mean. You just get more of a reputation. Yeah, and you get more definitely. work in Europe, and then you know, I've been fortunate enough to do it, keep playing. So yeah, but. Yeah, I mean, Derek, I mean, it was, yeah, Derek's something else. I mean, another per important person who sort of really, um, you know, like Mike Cooper, like I said, in Ox being in Oxford, mm -hmm. just down the road was Mike Cooper. And at that time, he was just living in Reading. And he, he was doing some out outrageous things. I remember he turned up with this little sampler and we was in his place and he started playing, doing this music. And we said, what is it? He goes, I don't know. And it turned out he was doing stuff like ambient music before he used the term. So he was doing all this stuff with crazy sampling and stuff. But he had no idea. He's just it's just Mike just working on something. And so, you know, and also he was really into reggae. Jeff mm -hmm. Hawk is a great tenor saxophone player. He dropped out of the scene because he just thought he got it's interesting because now the scene's a lot more open, but he got fed up. He said he got fed up because, you know, if you if you played a melody or played anything with rhythm, people would just look at you like mm -hmm. you, you know. You need to be gone. So you, you had this in both schools, you know, in the jazz school, oh, sure. the straight ahead school. If you did anything slightly dissonant, they were like, "What are you doing?" Yeah. And yet, yeah, it was almost dead to play a melody. So you can imagine what Eugene must have lost. That must have been like when Eugene started playing country and western. He tells me they all thought he'd lost his mind. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, you can imagine him turning up at the time and everybody's not playing any tunes, and he turns up singing country songs. <laughs> Yeah, but so, but you know, I think you need, you, you sometimes need to break things a bit. You know, like Steve okay. Beresford, who's a great friend of mine, you know, he's a great musician. You know, you hear those stories, I don't know, there's a story about him doing company and apparently Braxton and and my dad weren't too, you know, weren't too impressed and warning people, don't play with this guy. And apparently Eugene heard this. And of course, when he came to England, who was the first person he wants to play with? Steve Beresford, because he thought, what was this guy doing that these guys are warning you about him? You know. So. <laughs> Is that... Yeah. So it's so how was Eugene good. like? I mean, working with Eugene, like those '90s stuff you've done, you know, and later. Oh on. yeah, and that's yeah, crazy I mean, stuff. Actually, I mean, it was great to play with Eugene and Jimmy Carl Black, you know, and doing the Hendrix. And I remember the first time we met, 
So I knew it was Eugene, uh, and then he said, we're going to do this trip with Jimmy Carl Black. And of course, I'm like, Jimmy Carl Black, you know, wow. And when we turned up, I looked at Jim. He looked at me. We looked at Eugene, and we, we hadn't played a note. We just looked at each other and we said, yes, it's going to be good. And it, well, yeah, it's great. I mean, the first gig was just fantastic. And it, then mm. it came out, then it got all this attention, which was really weird, you know. And we did some nice gigs, yeah. But Jimmy's got some stories. I mean, he's just, I mean, that's another thing altogether. But, I mean, he told us a story about how Frank Zappa paid, gave, gave Jimi Hendrix his air player ticket, a ticket to go to, to play the Isle of Wight because he not no money. Oh my! Wow, hey, that's bizarre. Zappa man. gave him the money to get a ticket for the Isle of Wight at that time. You know, you know, we and we forget. You know, yeah, Hendrix was everywhere, but nobody had given him any. Nobody had given him any money. Yeah, you know that's why he went. You know, when they said, "Oh, he went." You know, when he that's why when he got the money, you look how quickly that like, what you'd buy in a studio. Sure. So at that time, he was going everywhere, and it was Zappa who gave him the money, man. That's bizarre. It's like, isn't that incredible? Yeah, I mean, the stories that Jimmy said, and he was saying Hendrix was very, uh, was always very aware of his as, uh, of his um, status, and um, mm -hmm. totally, you know, I mean, you know, this is sometimes, you know, they try to um, sort of divide Jimmy from the sort of black community, but he was totally, in, you know, he totally wasn't seen as an outsider. You know, that they made out somehow he was a lonely guy and not mm -hmm. connected to the black community. I mean, you know, Thanks to Jimmy, he was saying, oh, it's just a load of rubbish. You know, that Hendrix was really aware of that, but he was also aware that he had to keep, you know, that moving things on, you know. Yeah. And yeah. he was really into, he was really doing, really wanted to do more out stuff. And I think that's why he sort of left, you know, even though the trio, was, which is incredible, but he wanted to go even further. And I think, yeah. that, you know, he was talking about playing Gil Evans. Can you imagine what that would have sounded like? Oh, oh my God. Yeah. Hey? Probably it's a good thing because it would have been game over, wouldn't it? We'd all have to we'd all have to go and work in a supermarket, wouldn't we? <laughs> we'd just be like, "What would you do?" I mean, you know what I mean? You imagine if that had come off, if everybody was just saying, oh, "Forget it, exactly. it's over." Yeah, that's it. <laughs> you know, it's selling. Probably, I mean, it's crazy, but it's probably a blessing for us, you know, because <laughs> you hear some things about. And you just say, well, what would you do? You know, like, if, you know, Hen Hendrix, Gil Evans and Miles. I think everybody would just give up. We'd all yeah. just be like, we wouldn't be talking now, mate. We'd all be working in some shop saying, oh, wow, I heard that. That was it for me. I thought, forget it. You know, so, you know, but it's hard to believe. I mean, it, it's very hard, you know. So, yeah, so, and, and Jimmy told me now, which tells you the sign of the 60s, bless him, because, you know, he, but he was telling us, you know, because I said, well, how did Zappa take over the band? You're not going to believe this. He said they put an advert in a paper for a guitarist and they oh. got Zappa. And Zappa said to them, if you make me the leader of the band, I'll make you rich and famous. And they said, OK, that's how Zappa got to become the leader of the Mother's Invention. It wasn't his band. Wow. I didn't it know was, that. They, they just advertised for a guitarist and got Zappa. And he said he made us he made us famous, but he was rich. <laughs> he was the one who was rich. <laughs> I mean, can you imagine someone coming up to you and saying, "I mean, it showed you how in the sixties that sort of openness." Because you know, you can imagine going up to somebody now and saying, "Oh, well, if you make me the leader of your band, I'll make you rich and famous." You just said, you know, "Go home." I just said, oh, "Okay." So he just took over the band. And I suppose then, you know, with Zappa, and then he started getting to more complex things. Yeah. And they, you know, because I mean, you know, some of the music we're doing is ridiculous, isn't it? Um, but, you know, so, but it's just weird, you know, some saying, someone just saying, oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> Can you imagine doing an advert and you get Frank Zappa as the guitar player? That's quite cool, actually. <laughs> <laughs> That's quite cool. That's cool another enough. time altogether, isn't it? Oh, man, yeah. You know, it's. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and the thing is, it makes you realize those barriers then, because you know, even though they were down as a rock band, you couldn't, you couldn't, you know, if you did, if you have a band like Zappa now, nobody could book it, would they? They would Zero. never get played on the radio; it'd be just seen as too out. And you know, you think of the crowds, those people playing. I mean, it's avant garde music; it's like a lot of it's free improvisation with jazz, rock. It's everything. Yeah. You could never do that now. I mean, we are going backwards, I think. I think it was a golden period. It's very, oh, yeah, very quickly, but it's gone backwards, isn't it? 
you know, everybody now, it's like, if you haven't got some groove behind you, and I love groove, but it's like, oh, it's no groove, what is it? Yeah, you know? exactly. I mean, yeah. I mean, can you imagine apostrophe, a piece like apostrophe playing to 10,000, I don't know how many thousands of people. Can you imagine that? <laughs> It's not going to happen now. No, no, no way. No I way, remember man. hearing apostrophe, and I could not believe that. I thought that police piece is so ridiculously complex, and he's playing to thousands of people. Yeah, so it's, and you know things have gone back D- different now, times. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, you, you know, you had those psychedelic bands like Pink Floyd playing. Yeah, they were out, man. Thirty minutes on one court yeah, drone I of imagine. for I mean, ten thousand people, you know. <laughs> <laughs> what we've got now, you've got like cover bands, you know. I mean, you've got Oasis cover bands. I mean, how mad is that? You know, like That's crazy. Yeah. You know, I mean, I remember hearing the thing. So, what was that? That Liam guy saying something about how complex, you know, uh, some piece was. It was like it had three chords, man. It was three chords, and he was like, "Oh, this is really complex." I'm thinking, you know, how many chords does Dapper have in one band? <laughs> <laughs> they added the E minor in between, you know. That's, yeah, that's kind of that's really awesome. I mean, you you must know that story. That was it. Was it? Um, oh, the great back guitar Steve Vai, isn't it? Where he, you know, and 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 Dapper just kept winding him up, saying, "Can you do this in seventeen eight? Yeah, yeah I love that story. Eight? I mean, it's just fantastic. But you can imagine, I could have just loved that. I loved Zappa to say what he's, you know, when, when that guy. From the waist of saying, Oh, this piece is really hard. And it's like, can you imagine Zappa thinking, We've got three chords, man. <laughs> and the musicianship of that band, because George oh, Duke, I love to death, you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so flat music is so hard. And I think he's totally under, I mean, I know he's appreciated, but I, don't, I think people don't realize just incredible keyboard player that guy yeah, yeah. was. Yeah. I mean, he could play anything. Oh man, you know the the bands in the seventies with uh, what what Schofield was in it and Billy Cobham and you, you know that. Oh group. yeah, I love that. Was, like... That was one of the records that really opened things up for me because I saw them on Old Grey Whistle Test. Yeah, on the BBC, and I remember and I remember saying I've got to get that record because I mean I'd never heard anything like it. Yeah, and I remember seeing for, um, Return to Forever on the TV and you know Stanley Clark. I thought. He can't be a bass player. He just no, you know, you know, bass players can't play like that. I mean, you know, they really push things. Yeah, that's yeah, incredible. So it was an incredible yeah. period. Yeah, I mean, back then. Oh, yeah. yeah, and then you've yeah. got, you know, you see, so you've got all the, that amazing jazz rock stuff. And now it's like you said, yeah. you know, it's like people are like, you know, yeah. do a two chord vamp, and then like, oh man, that's heavy. That's, that's complex. Heavy. That's some yeah, complex yeah, shit, man. I was thinking, <laughs> I tried my hip pockets. I think they start off with an incredible groove, but the end of it, they're swinging like crazy, aren't yeah. they? And Schofield's guitar. Oh man, I love. It. Yeah, it's yeah. still my favorite. Some of my favorite Schofield is still there. Mine too. Groove, yeah. Oh, but uh, Pat, I, 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 I wanted to ask you before already. Like, uh, how did you get involved into, you know, late of. 80s, I guess, or, or in the 90s, into tapes and mm-hmm. electronics and all this stuff, which was quite um, you know, new actually back then, still, right? Yeah, um, I I think it, I'd always been interested in electronics and stuff, but couldn't afford some of the gear, just couldn't afford it. Anyway, you know, they came out with a cheap sampler, Yamaha and Casio, so I got the Yamaha, and then I found a mini mixer, and I was always doing things with tapes, so I started doing. Um, recording things and I started to play the uh, cassette player like an instrument mm. so I was I, I was actually um, I mean that, I mean, I don't do it anymore because my own back gear got stuck I mean you'll love this so I had all that gear up until the 90s and you wouldn't believe it um, I was doing the gig you know how you're busy and I was on the gig and I was trying to get a cat nap on the on the on the bus got off the bus got off the stop and realized I'd left my bag no problem. They said, don't worry, you know, when he comes round. Do you know that the bus driver gave my gear to somebody else? That's how I lost all my gear. I had to rethink my whole approach. Okay. But I developed this thing where I was playing the cassette recorder like an instrument, like like um, I was using a 12-tone concept. So I, I'd have wow. all these things, and then I had a mini disc, and I'd have used the shuffle. But it was all very much... Um, the shuffle was great because it allowed me to always play something different. But I decided I'd have all this stuff on there. And then in a way I could, wherever I played, it would always be a different combination. I learned to play um, the instruments. So I was doing lots of fast forwarding and rewinding. Mm. 
I mean, so when I did Hellington Country, Eugene wanted me to utilize that. So I had to really develop it because, you know, I was using Duke, I mean, you know, because it was, um, again, yeah, that was, uh, you know, all Duke Ellington. So I had to use all these Duke Ellington stuff and then sort of fit it in, in the piece. And it, I mean, he writes some crazy stuff. I remember me and Alex came round to my place and uh, we were like, what is it? <laughs> and believe me, Alex Ward's an incredible musician. If he says, what is it? <laughs> you know there's something going on. I mean, the group was incredible because, you know, you know, Leslie Ross and Curry Shaw, you know, they're fantastic readers. But some of the, you know, but he had written in all this cassette stuff with, with Duke, you know. I mean, it's, I mean, it's just, you know, I mean, you know, Eugene's a genius. Yeah, you Eugene is, yeah. You know, <laughs> I mean, I love the guy to death. He's just a genius. But, so I had to, you know, so it made me develop it even more after that. Because I had to, you know, before, and I just in an improvised context, you didn't have to worry about it. I suddenly have to start thinking about bar lines and all this. So I developed all this way of you now to do the super fast things playing, you know, so I could play these pieces for, for Eugene, you know. Mm. And then I kept continuing it and developing it a bit more in other, in other contexts. And maybe in some ways, to be honest with you, sometimes it's about, because you know, when you've got now a vocabulary, and I could do it. I mean, I could if I wanted to. I could do it in my sleep. So maybe it was good that it got stopped. <laughs> you know, because I was getting to the stage where I could um, do almost anything with that gear, you know. Mm. And um, so I always think, oh, maybe, you know, I'm, I'm just trying to be optimistic. I was just trying to be positive about it. But I was wrecked, you know what I mean? And then 15 right. years of work <laughs> just disappeared. But then I'm now, my setup is really easy. I've just got an um, Air Mac. I use two iPads mm, and a okay. mini keyboard. It all fits into my laptop case. So nobody can have to me. Because you know what the nightmares with, yeah, yeah. you know, going on planes. I mean, there must be still a for guitar. But, you know, I've got none of that. They can't do anything to me. It all fits in the laptop case now. That's and right. you know people think it's on you know but you know i suddenly realized the technology's finally caught up with the musicians because some of the things that we wanted they just weren't around and now some of the apps that are here are things and it's yeah, all it's on crazy. these two ipads it's amazing yeah, so it's crazy yeah. after 40 years you can actually all right you can do this can you say oh, which they would do that which they would do and now of course nothing i mean not going to listen to people the likes of me or mr barrett you know what I mean? you know yamaha's not going to take any notes of all you know like could you do this with your keyboard, you know? But now there's some amazing apps. So, yeah, I can do gigs with just two iPads. And if I want to play a keyboard, I use a mini keyboard because now there's no latency, isn't there? Yeah, you know yeah, exactly. I mean? so that was always that's crazy. Now, yeah. I mean, I don't know for the guitar. I'm sure my brother said that he, he just said, he just gave up on MIDI guitars because he said the latency is just Yeah, it used to be know. really bad. Now it's cool. Now it's... Like the latency is like oh, it's, oh, right. oh, zero, yeah. zero, zero, nothing. It's wow. you don't see it, so it's, it's I mean, amazing. That was, that was like a, that was like the ultimate waste of money, and a guitar player <laughs> would get a bit, of, you know, get a good gig. Oh, I'm gonna buy a MIDI guitar, and he'd be like, You just see it on the shelf. <laughs> guitar player, just like, Oh, I wish I'd never brought that <laughs> exactly. That's kind of... Yeah, but oh, that's good. They've sorted that out. I mean, I don't know why. I mean, I know the signal because I don't know. My brother says that he went back to Val because he said, he said, you just can't get beat that sound. I don't know mm -hmm. if it's like, you know, that he reckoned that there was the way that the signal worked. You can only, only get some certain sounds if it's a Val valve. Oh, yeah. I don't know if that's the, is that, do you find that as well? That certain sounds you want, you can only get through the valve. Yeah, yeah. I mean, but wow. now, now it's changed. It's changed now. Now it's, uh -huh. now it's quite crazy the technology and what you have now you know I, I i record a lot at home and it's just like mm -hmm. what you can do at home it's crazy like like you said you know like i know evan parker stuff oh, now yeah, this honestly, possibility it's like man it's bizarre it's true i mean like i've got lot i've got the latest you know i've got logic and then the things i can do now, i mean like, like you said you've got literally you know you've got your studio in your home and it's hard yeah. to believe it's like you only go out because you like to meet people, you know, but you don't need you don't meet once you've got logic or something. You know what I mean? It's like, That's crazy. It's scary. I mean, everything is on it now. I mean, you know, the things you can do. And like you said, we're only still, I think we're still scratching the surface, you know, because, you know, I love the remote thing. I can just stay in my chair and do this crazy stuff, you know. So, um, but no, the you know, it's finally caught up with us. So now, yeah. yeah. 
no, no, these, these are the airlines. They don't even know I exist because I just go on with my laptop case. Can't touch me. And all my gear's in there. So when they look at, you know, when they see a musician in the bath, I go, oh, yeah, what sort of musician are you? You know? <laughs> yeah, it's way more easier. You yeah. Know? Yeah. yeah it's way way lot easier. easier now, yeah. yeah. But I have to say, they've sorted out those problems that used to be, because as you know, doesn't I, I mean, people say, you know, I know there's all this talk about AI. Really, anybody's worked with computers, you know, it's just, I mean, it's a joke. There's no AI. Computer has no idea. Logic, it's a, it's a bit of a contra, it's a bit of an irony name, isn't it? Because if you know logic, sometimes the simplest thing, it'd be like... It's, it's illogical, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's totally <laughs> something that you can do in two seconds. Logic yeah, yeah. be like, excuse me, I have no idea what you want me to do now. <laughs> you know? <laughs> I mean, I don't think people realise. I always used to have a backup system. So I'd think, if this doesn't work, I'll have this. If that doesn't... And I'm sure it's the same. But let, you know, people see and they think, oh, you've got so many... Gear. Yeah, because something's going to go wrong at the wrong time. <laughs> yeah. So that's how I get round it. But now I think it's a lot easier with the, with the you know, the iPad. I've had no problem just using two iPads. I've done gigs just with two iPads. I'm, I'm going to uh-huh. be playing with Thurston more. In a uh, next week, I oh, really, and I'm just oh, going to bring two iPods. Yeah, we're doing it. I'm going to give it in somewhere. When we're in a chat uh, gallery in London. I mean, in, and the uh, the thing is, I'll just turn up the two iPads, man. You know, oh. it's, yeah, yeah. Thirsting, he's outrageous, isn't he? I mean, yeah, oh, he's, man. He's, he's, uh, Speaking about like Zappa and Derek oh, Bailey God, players, oh, you know, he's well, you, you, you'll love this then. So the first time I got to play with Thirsting, more, I had no idea who he is. So he put he was out to put some band together at um at what's you know at the jazz cafe the old jazz cafe mm-hmm. and so Lowell Coxall, Alan Thomason, Simon Fell, oh, all yeah. sorts you know sort of like you know and I was out to do it and I had no idea who this guy was you know I'd never heard of him you know because sometimes you know you get cut off from things so anyway I said to Alex and you know Alex just like Alex would have given me his give me his soul. He would have given me his soul if he could. He's like, please, you've got to let me get me on that gig. You've got to get me to see Thurston. Because he was like his hero. Never heard of the guy. Anyway, so we turn up. So it's Thurston Moore and Lee Ronaldo. Never heard of these guys. And I just remember thinking, uh, we looked out the window. Me and Noel, were, we had no idea that these guys were rock superstars. This is how out of it we were at the time. So we look out the window. We see this, we see this queue, like a mile-long queue. And it's like four o'clock in the afternoon. We said, oh, typical. There's another gig on. And then we've gone to see this other. We had no idea when they came to see us. <laughs> so, so you know, these guys turn up. And, you know, I don't know. Anyway, I do remember. You know, so the group was really good. And I thought, these guys are pretty out there. You know, because, you know, they're supposed to be wrong. And then, you know, I think Alex played me some, um, some Sonic Youth. Right? Mm-hmm. I just thought, this, these guys are out there. I couldn't believe they were getting away with it, with the tunings yeah. and everything. Yeah. I thought, how did they make? How could they make money doing that? Yeah, bizarre. Yeah, <laughs> it's totally. But you know, again, it's that timing, isn't it? I think first didn't got in at the last moment because now forget it. Yeah, you yeah. do anything and it's not it's not in the diatonic scale. No way you could have drink like Sonic. You do anything good there. Yeah. I mean, you know, and yeah, he's just yeah, he's a great improviser. You know. He's a great, he's really, I mean, we did a, um, we were lucky enough to play um, Maggie Nichols, great vocalist. She did a residency and she asked me and Thurston to play with her. And then we got to play, which was a dream come true for both of us. Mm-hmm. So Maggie Nichols and Judy Tippett, and we did a quartet with them, which we definitely have to do again. Oh, beautiful. And it was great, you know, I mean, you know, you're two great singers and we had a great time. But no, so I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, but I'm just going to turn the two iPads, man. You know? <laughs> Be yeah, it's yeah. great. You know what I mean. I can just go. I can go on the coach, on the train, with your laptop thing and your gear. That's it. That's my gear. And I just like I just got my little mini mixer, plug in, you know, whatever's there, little amp or whatever, and um, that's I'm away. Huge. Yeah, that's yeah. perfect. Yeah, but I yeah. couldn't do that forty years ago. I mean, I used to. I mean, I, I mean, I was talking to Steve Bursford about that, and I don't know how we did it. We must have been weightlifters, but we didn't really. I mean. I don't know how I could go around, and I don't drive. I can't believe the gear I was going around with on the bus. But you do that, isn't it, for the music? You know, you'll do these mad things. I mean, I, I mean, I remember I used to go around and you know, take that and I'd go up a flight of stairs. Why are the gigs always got 
to flight the stairs. Exactly. That's crazy. All this gear, you go to the room, you know, and it's it's just crazy what we were doing, you know. But I suppose yeah. that's it, isn't it? When you're mad about music, that's what you do, isn't it? You don't think anything about it. I'm yeah. sure you've had the same there, you know. Like, yeah, and I was carrying you know, my, my 27 about, kilo amplifier. Yeah, everywhere. That's what I was like, thinking, you know, those amplifiers. <laughs> I, was, I, I mean, like I said, you know, it's one thing with Hendrix has got like a road crew, you know, like I mean, yeah. stuck it. But for most guitarists, it's hard enough carrying one amp, never learn all that stuff, you know. But yeah, I don't know how we do it, man. But you still, well, it's the love of the music, isn't it? I think so, yeah. But no, it's easy now, man. It's easy it's, now. It's not for the love of money, I would say. So. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> I remember I must have been about 35 and I suddenly thought, oh, maybe I should try and get some money out of this thing. You know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I was so busy enjoying playing music. And suddenly, suddenly thought, yeah, maybe. <laughs> I remember Braxton said something about, you know, when he, he got married and, you know, he's got three kids and he's thinking, oh, maybe I can't live on Twinkies anymore. You know? <laughs> you know? But yeah, you do. It's, it's, it's funny. The music exactly. really does. You don't think about those things now, man. These kids now, man, they've all got like degrees in business. You know, first yep. they're talking about, oh, have you pitched it? I mean, have you got, I mean, a website, all that stuff. I mean, I've sort of done it slowly, but these guys have got websites. They've got everything. Everything, yeah. It's like, it, yeah, it's crazy, man. You, you know. I know. I, I mean, yeah. I remember when, um, uh, Derek telling me about this. There was a guy called, um, oh, I can't know. Pete, uh, oh, he did the imp European Improvisers thing, which had become like the one everybody still checks out. And um, I remember he said, Oh, this guy's going to make up a website. I don't think it'll last long. It's like being around for 20 years. <laughs> but we were very skeptical of the idea of the internet being of any use to us. Yeah. It's amazing. It's. Isn't it? it's... I remember, you know, Derek was like, oh, yeah, this internet, can't see it lasting. I mean, it saved our lives, hasn't it? Because it's made things so much cheaper, you know, emails. Yeah. I mean, now you, know, you couldn't do it after stuff without internet. Yeah. You wonder how we did it, how we did things without it, but you did. Yeah. You know? I mean, it helps a lot with the promotion, you know, even doing these interviews and talks. I, I, yeah, I, would, yeah. I would never think of doing this, like, even three years ago. Yeah, enough said. Yeah, you, you know. I yeah. mean, I I looked at the body of people you've interviewed, and I just was astounded. You must have covered every. You've covered every area, man. But it's scary, yeah, man. I, because I it's saw the interview with Mike Stern, and that was hilarious. I mean, I love. I think he was outrageous, but, but I couldn't believe the guy said about. I mean, I'm out of you, out of it. He was on those gigs, man. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's bizarre, man. But it's just. I like mean, you know, you play the ball like, <laughs> where am I? You know. <laughs> <laughs> That's brilliant. That's just brilliant. Yeah, I see it. I go, yeah. Miles who? Miles yeah. Davis? I've heard that name somewhere. Can you imagine? <laughs> yeah, That's man. Bizarre. No, but I think it's amazing the people you've managed to do. But no, you know, it makes life different. Yeah. 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 That's great. But That's uh, great. Pa Pat, well, what's what's on the schedule for you? Like this, you know, you oh, mentioned the Thirst More thing, but as well. Next week I'd play with uh, you, uh, with uh, Thurston and um, I think Whitechapel, mm -hmm. and then a couple of days later I'm going to be at Wigmore Hall with Elaine Michener, it's a great vocalist, um, with a group with Jason Yard. Uh, hopefully, it's, hopefully because you know, Paul Jason had a had a stroke. And yeah, I've heard that. Yeah. Yeah. he's um and Neil Charles. Oh wow, fantastic! So I'm looking forward to that, and I'm supposed to be doing a duo, you know, do some duo stuff with Elaine. And then I've got some gigs with John Dykeman, Steve Noble, and John Edwards. Ooh, oh, that's um, going to be awesome. And, yeah, and a trio with John Butcher and Stuller. Stuller, mm -hmm. you know, so that, that'll be fun. And then later in the year, I I mean, I don't know where, hopefully uh, the next Ahmed release is coming out. Oh, fantastic. I love that stuff, yeah. I love that stuff. Yeah, and uh, yeah, it's looking good. I've been asked to do counter blows and yeah, I mean, you know, you can sort of... <laughs> Sort of getting gigs now is really weird, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, on a you know on a basis where you don't have to think about, you know, you just sort of know you've got stuff coming in, you know. So it's a bit, it's a, but yeah, it's nice and it's all nice stuff. I do tap loss with Seymour Wright and uh, Paul uh, Paul Abbott and uh, uh, was it Billy? Uh, all sorts of people. Yeah, Christabel Riley. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there's lots of stuff coming up, and then a new trio called Jump um, with. Um, Andrea Silvia uh, called Giordano, 
who is incredible. She does voice and electronics. Mm -hmm. And Maria, I can't pronounce her surname, plays alto and flute. Fantastic player. Mm. So, yeah, and it's not, there's a lot of new young players also doing. Uh, I don't know if you've come across Mariam Rizai, Turntables. No, no, not yet. She's, she's the one. Okay. She's a monster. And if I say she's a monster, we did a gig with Blacktop, you know, me and Orphie, and we asked her to do. She just tests. She's the thing about Mariam is that she's doing turntables, but she's also a piano player. So can you imagine she's got piano technique That's on great. turntables? That's fantastic. It's insane what she's doing. I mean, I'm glad to say she did. She's start getting recognised because she just got. She was um, up for the. She got the Paul Hamlin Award, and she really deserved it. But yeah, watch out for Miriam Rizai. She's going to take over everything, man. <laughs> Seriously, killer. You know, because you know, you think you've heard it all on, you know, like Christian Markley, fantastic, and other people on turntables. And then you hear Miriam, you just think, what on earth is this? It's really out there. And she can do, she can do all the, um, she's done the competition stuff as well. Mm. So she can do all the breakbeat stuff, but she can also do stuff that you've never, you know, like, she can do really abstract. I mean, seriously, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Marion Rizai, yeah, you, you watch out for her. I'll check her out. Cool, great. Yeah, she'll, she'll be good, but yeah, Stuart and the composer as well. Yeah, so it's good that I'm, I've been asked to do something with them. Come out, you know, more mother in May. So two dates in in, in England somewhere. <laughs> That's, that's the sort of information you just get. You just get a thing like Are you free these dates, and I thought, oh yeah, I'm free. Yeah, I'm yeah. looking forward to playing with her. Yeah, I, I love Kamei. She's great. Beautiful. Fantastic. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it's looking good, and hoping to do um other things. You know, got yeah, got. I mean, um, is um, a lot of things are sort of happening, and also I got a gig, nice gig at a trio called Blade School with uh, Tony Oral and. Dom Lash, where we did the music of Paul Blade. Oh, yeah, that's one. Know. Oh, yeah, I love yeah. that stuff. Yeah, that was beautiful. Yeah, so that's a nice, yeah, uh, doing some of that. And we're planning to do this year, so this is hot off the press, as they say. We're thinking of doing an electronic version, you know, like me doing some, you know, cause you know, when Paul Blade did all these albums where he's playing synthesizer. Yeah. So we might, we're thinking about doing that, which would be a lot of fun. Beautiful. You know, doing a studio album, yeah. So, yeah, so yeah, it's all sorts of things going on. You're gonna be yeah, busy, fantastic, yeah. yeah, cool, great, Pat. Uh, yeah, well, thanks, man. It's great to see you. Yeah, you, you know, you'll be able to get to play someday, you know. No, we have to, we have to. Otherwise, we do a yeah, long definitely. distance now. We talked about long distance. You record some stuff, and I record at home. <laughs> oh, I well, know, it'll be fun, but yeah, I, I'm not sure what that, but like I said, this thing it, it's gone clear. Yeah, I mean, yeah. like, you know, Zoom was a joke anyway for, yeah, for yeah. music, but now this thing's another Yeah, I'll check it out. I'll check it out what it is. Yeah. 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 That's cool. Good. Yeah. Thanks for coming. Thanks, man. Take care. Yes, man. I, I hope to see you soon and uh, we'll catch you next together. So.